Hello everybody and welcome to another video. I would like to let you in, let's say, a little bit behind the scenes of the production of a Cute Widgets and More video. You see, when Jesper records the video, from time to time he asks me or asks some other colleague of mine at KDAB uh, to provide a little commentary about what did he just say in that video. Was it, does it make sense? Was it good? Was it bad? Well, he just released a video about structured bindings in C++ and I decided, you know what, rather than just commenting to you, I'm going to comment to everybody so that everybody sees how much effort really goes behind producing one of these videos. So I've got the video ready, it's right here. If you have not seen it yet, uh, please just check out the link in the video description, go watch it and then come back here. I will provide you some feedback as a form of, uh, well, constructed, constructive, criticism, I would say, yeah, to what Jesper just said in his video. Welcome to Cute Widgets and More. In today's episode, we're going to attack a problem from the ancient time, namely how do you return values, multiple values, mind you, from a function. More specifically, we'll see how structural bindings works together with the special Qt type, QHash and QMap, and more so, we'll see how they become beautiful whenever you iterate over the elements of a QMAP, Q, QMAP, QMAP or a QHash. Stay tuned. Let's jump right into the code and look at what did it look like in the really old days. I have this function here, split path. It takes a path, as you can see down here, and it splits out the base and the extension. The base is my file and the extension is MP5. Okay, it's from the future. So in this split here, what I need to do is return two things, namely the base and the extension. So I take them in as references to QString. As you can see down here, I create my base and extension. I call my path and they will be magically filled. Of course, there was a lot of discussion back then whether it should be pointers or references. And at some point, somebody said, well, why don't we return a record? So, or struct. So we, re we returned struct and it was annoying that we needed to create structs just to return those. And at some point, somebody came around and said, hey, let's create a kind of meta struct, namely a tuple or for the specialization of two, a pair. And that Okay, so let's take things one at a time because Jesper has just said a lot of things in there. So let's analyze what he's just said. First thing first, okay? Uh, ignoring the tuple or the pair aspect of this for a second, uh, there are two important aspects here. First and foremost, do not ever do path manipulation like he's doing in that code. I get it, it's example code. But if you landed on this video, <laughs> maybe searching hey, how do I split a path into the base name of a file and extension of a file? Well, don't use this method. Please use the proper classes that you can have around. There are some classes in Qt, like QFile info mostly, and also QDIR, uh, that allow you to take a path and split it into its own components. So first and foremost, use those classes and don't do this. Don't search for a dot, don't search for a forward slash or stuff like that, because it's always brittle and dangerous to do it by hand. Second thing, it was referring to the aspect of uh, returning uh, references or passing references or passing pointers. So uh, as you can see in this snippet of code, he's passing a reference to the base string uh, on line 44 and a reference to the X string, uh, uh, again, on line 44. And the idea is that, of course, the called function is going to mutate them. It's going to set something into base. It's going to set something into uh, X. Uh, that all makes sense, right? Uh, the debate that he was referring to when he said uh, there's always been this back and forth between passing pointers or passing references. Well, that debate has to do with the fact that uh, if you take a look at line 44 alone, all right, suppose that you don't see the split path function. Well, it's not entirely clear that that particular call is modifying base and it's modifying ext, all right? Uh, when you just look at that, it looks like that you're passing these uh, parameters into the function and it's not obvious that they are actually used as out parameters. So creator here is 
smarter than usual and so it makes the base and ext as you can see there uh, in italics i believe that's a setting that you can toggle somewhere in creator settings and it's there to highlight that uh, this function is not just taking these as input this function is modifying them possibly uh, but that style, for instance, is not universal. I would uh, definitely uh, recommend you to investigate a little bit. Uh, and of course, around other code styles. Uh, in Qt itself, this style is, for instance, bound. What in Qt we do is that instead of passing a reference as an out argument, uh, we pass a pointer as an out argument. The difference as far as the C++ machine is trivial, uh, but the important bit is that at call site, you see base with an ampersand behind it, right? If you need to pass a pointer to base, you don't just write base like a reference, you pass, uh, you write ampersand base. And so this makes it much more clear to the reader, to the casual reader of this code. Remember that you may be reading this code 10 years from now. It makes it so much more clear that the function is modifying the contents of base, it's modifying the contents of ext. Also, as much as I like, Editors like Qt Creator that uh, use a lot of uh, uh, meta information via formatting. Uh, remember that this is not the only way that you will deal with, uh, will interact with this code. For instance, if you do a code review and you're likely going to use some sort of web based tool, well, then it's not entirely obvious that you are going to have the same kind of highlighting. And so you may miss some important information. Passing something like a pointer with an ampersand makes it much more obvious, again, what's happening. Anyways, that's a side consideration. Let's continue. That's what it looks like in the next step here. I return a pair of strings and strings. And uh, now the QMake pair here returns that or create that, that pair. And I can return this. And this code works perfectly fine with C++11 in C++. 14, 17, you don't even need the QMake pair anymore. But back then, you did. Okay, one more code reviewer getting this. Uh, look exactly at the manipulation that is being done in there. Uh, you're taking the path string and you're finding an offset. You're extracting basically two substrings out of that path string. Now, again, in modern C++ design, if you want to do that, surely you would still do more or less like that, but uh, likely you will not pass an argument of type QString. This function is a pretty good candidate for passing something like a QString view, because when you think about it, this function all it needs to do is to have read-only, non-owning access to the contents of a path. So why should you pass, pass specifically a QString? Maybe you want to pass something else, maybe just a string literal in C++. Uh, do you need to build a Q string out of Q string literal just to call this function? Not really when you think about it. You're still going to, to sub-split that and so to allocate two extra strings. But you know, now we're splitting hairs. Uh, I'm just pointing out we have talked about Q string view in the past, I believe, somewhere along with these lines. I'm going to leave you again a couple of links in the video description talking about this. And so uh, that makes sense in this context. And I almost forgot, there is one last thing that I wanted to discuss in uh, this particular piece of code. So, uh, yes, standard tie is uh, a very convenient utility to have, uh, but of course it only works with things that come from the standard library, such as uh, standard pair or standard tuple. And so maybe you, be one, you may be wondering, uh, does QPair also offer the same functionality as standard tie? And the answer is, uh, no, it doesn't. But also, yes, it does, because in Qt6, uh, QPair is nothing but an alias to standard pair. So whenever you see QPair in your source code, uh, think about it in terms of standard pair. And if you see a function like standard tie, uh, which typically would work only with something like standard pair, now you know that actually this works also with the QPair. We also have a version here that returns a std pair and in C++11, we already had the beauty of a new construct here called std tie. So my split path returned a std pair. And over here, I could unpack it right where I called the function std tie base and extension. 
that was just one problem with Stutzai, namely that I needed to declare the base and extension names before I called Stutzai. And what I really wanted was just something that smelled like Python, where I could just write the names right on that line and invent them on the line where the return was. But unfortunately, C11 didn't allow that to me. But 2011 is 11 years back now. And in 17, we got this new thing called structural bindings. And let's see what it looks like with structural bindings. Okay, yes, sir. A uh, couple of things there. <laughs> Maybe you have a time machine, but uh, well, you're younger than me. I know that uh, C plus plus eleven and two thousand eleven was already twelve years back by the time we published this video. That's true. And you say that C plus plus seventeen uh, brought something called structural bindings. Now I hate to nitpick here, but I just want to underline this, uh, they are not called structural bindings, they are called structured bindings. Now, yes, of course, uh, tomato, tomato, potato, potato, same thing. Uh, but, you know, if you're writing documentation down, if you're writing a commit message, uh, if you're searching for this particular thing onto a search engine, then you may want to use the correct spelling, which is structured binding and not structural binding. Or, if you want to score a lot of points with your hardcore C++ developers, the formal names for uh, this formal name for these sort of things is actually structured binding declaration because that's what they are. They are declarations. So with structural bindings, the code down here now looks like this. It's still returning a std pair as before, and down here I write const auto reference square bracket base comma extension. And had I been an actor, I would have been shedding a tear now in joy. Fortunately, I'm not an actor, as you can tell, and I'm not too thrilled that I need to write const auto reference. But hey, that's the, the, the boundaries that we are within in C++. So I'll just accept that I write that. At least I don't need to have two lines declaring base and extension anymore. OK. Now, here's the thing. Do you like the code as it is right now? I mean, I didn't bring this up just yet in the previous, ex in the previous example, in the previous iteration with uh, uh, something like standard pair. But even right here, right now, uh, you have something, you've got a function, you call it, and you get back something. And then you disassemble that something, you destructure that something into uh, two local variables, base and ext. Now, do you like this? Well, if you're looking at the syntax, as Jesper says, of course I do like this, right? This is very convenient syntax. Uh, allows us not to pre-declare things, allows us not to use the awkward, uh, awkwardness of standard tie, which also has some other limitations, uh, namely the types that it really works with, and so on and so forth. Uh, but you need to consider here something much more in important, which is uh, the design of your API. When you have an API and the API returns a pair of strings, what does that API tell you? What does the first string contain? What does the second string contain? Yeah, it doesn't say very much. Okay, it's got two strings. It could be, I don't know, first name, last name. It could be base name of a file, extension. Or maybe it's the extension and then the base name. Maybe it's last name and then the first name. You don't necessarily know what you're getting back out of uh, a structured binding like this. Uh, the main reason why this is kind of questionable as an API is that uh, we are using names for the two components of this pair, all right? We are saying that the first part is the base and the second part is the extension. And uh, who's coming up with these names is not the author of the split path function. The author of the split path function is just returning a, um, a pair, an object with two fields. These fields are technically even called in a very weird way. They're just called first and second. And these fields don't give the caller any information whatsoever about what they're all about, how they're supposed to be used. And you're now forcing the caller of split path to come up with two sensible names for the two components into the pair. Now the caller here is doing the right thing, base and extension, but think again about 
first name, last name, or last name, first name, right? Uh, this opens the door to very subtle bugs that uh, uh, you may introduce inside your code base if you start deciding uh, to return things like pairs and you somehow lose control about what are the exact semantics of the object that I'm returning, okay? Uh, I could insist on more, but I, I don't want to repeat something which is kind of well-known, double quote, inside the C++ community. There is even a core guideline, a C++ core guideline, whose link is once more in the video description, uh, that tries to talk about some of the shortcomings of things like returning pair-like objects uh, and let them destructor by the caller. Okay, so just something to think about a little bit, uh, besides the convenience that structured bindings bring in terms of, of syntax. But anyways, let's go ahead. It also works with uh, Qtuple or Q, Qpair, as we had from, from the Qt world, exactly same code. And actually, it even works my, with my own struct. So if I have a struct up here, I can just unpack it with structural bindings. And of course, let me to, well, how far can I take this? And at the end of this video, I will show you step number seven, structural bindings with my own class, but you'll stay tuned for that because first... Okay, just one second, I'll go back a few, yeah, a few seconds and we will discuss this other approach here. So this is the other approach uh, that I was discussing, uh, that I was talking about, rather than just returning a pair, Okay, which doesn't tell you anything in terms of uh, its individual components, uh, you can just achieve pretty much the same by returning a little struct that still contains two strings, like this my struct here in the code. Uh, there is a substantial difference inside between this API and a pair API. Here, the name of the members of the struct are chosen by the implementer of split path. So split path is not longer returning to you something like a pair whose members are first and second. Split path is returning to you uh, a struct whose members are, have names base and extension. So the caller can take that struct, access base, access extension, and they always know that uh, the semantics of those, those fields um, uh, are the ones expected by uh, this are the semantics of split path. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> Get, getting a little stuck there. Uh, but when we destructure this struct inside a structured binding, uh, once more, are we sure that the first member of my struct is the base and the second member of my struct is the extension? Now, here's something that uh, is not perhaps entirely obvious the first thing, the first time that one uh, sees structured binding declarations. Uh, look again at this code, all right? You've got a mystruct that is returned by split path and uh, that mystruct is then destructured into two local objects. Now, the names of those local objects, the base and ext uh, that uh, we are creating on line 47, those names don't need to match at all the names inside your struct, okay? They could be foo and bar as far as split path is concerned. Uh, the binding there is strictly positional. So the first member of my struct gets mapped onto the first thing, on the first name that you declare, the second member on the second name, and so on and so forth. Uh, by accident, these names here are the same, but they are not required to be. Just think again, a pair as first and second, and we were just renaming them into base and next. So here it just happens they are the same, and so the semantics match. But again, consider a future evolution of this code where somebody, for instance, changes the order of the members inside your structure. Okay, so your my struct, for whatever reason, becomes extension and then base. Now, if you are not using structured bindings, if you're taking that my struct result and then you're accessing the members by name, so my struct uh, dot base or dot ext, the order of declaration actually doesn't matter at all, right? You, of course, recompile your code, of course, there are these kind of concerns, but uh, that is all good. Here, what happens if you change the order of the members inside my struct? Well, the 
the, the structuring on line 47 gets broken and gets broken in a very evil and subtle way because the code still compiles, you still get two strings back, uh, but their semantics now are completely changed. What you call base is actually extension, what you call ext is actually the base. So always be a little bit careful about thinking, should I need to destructure a given type? Should I create the structural types uh, in my APIs? There is always something to think about regarding the long-term evolution of your code base. Yes, first we need to discuss when are they even interesting. Of course, otherwise I'm going to lose you here and you'll click on to the next uh, kitten video on YouTube. So why are these structural bindings interesting? They are not interesting to avoid writing string base string extension, uh, but go straight on to getting the base and extension. No, they are interesting when you iterate over a Q map or a Q hash or the C++ counterpart from STL, the ordered or unordered map. And in those situations, it's interesting because you would get the value and key out of the map right away. But let's jump right over to me in the small version and see the code. So what we see here now is a const auto reference key comma value on my map. And my map is a stood map up here with a bunch of items. And I can just iterate over it like this. And there's no more dot first and dot second. I can even modify the elements in here. So instead of a const auto reference, just auto reference key comma value. And now I can modify them. And uh, just to show that it worked, I printed out. So let's see ranges STL maps in loop. It is right up here. Ranges STL map in loop. Uh, they are modified one, one, two. Well, that's the unmodified version where I print out the key and the value here. And here I now have modified them, which you saw by adding these arrows on each side of the value. No, no, stop. Don't go to those kid videos yet if you're a cute developer, because it doesn't work that well out of the box with our good friends QMAP and QHash. And let's see why that is. Remember, a few months back, I had an interview with Pepe on QS const, and he explained to me that a range based for loop basically is just a regular old style iterators behind the scene. And if you look here at take two, you can already see what these look like back then. We asked for the begin or the const begin of our map that gave us an iterator. We compared that against the end and plus plus to go next. And the key thing was that we looked at the values with asterisk it. Okay. Go up and look at the range based for loop here. There is no iterators, no nothing. But when I print out the, the value that I get assigned here is, of course, the asterisk it. You can see that's four, five, and six. So the, the C, plus, the cute version of the map, it just gives me the, the values of the items that I'm iterating over. But what the, the structural bindings expect is that you will get a pair that it can unpack. And uh, I don't get a pair here. So unfortunately, that doesn't work with my structural bindings. What I need is a pair when I iterate. And fortunately, there is a version called const key value begin that was added for exactly that purpose, or likely added before, namely, of course, we have the same problem with algorithms in C. So therefore, we have these const key value begin, const key value end. And what that does now is it returns a std pair of uh, the key and the value. And I can access those with pointer first, pointer second. Yes, yes, yes. I know you're getting impatient and want to know how you can iterate using range-based for loops over a map or a hash from Qt. And that's exactly what we're going to see now. We had the problem that the iterator did not return the right thingy, namely a std pair. We found that there was an iterator that did that, and that's the iterator that we need. But that's not the iterator that dot begin is going to provide us. And we didn't see the dot begin in the range based for loop, did we? No, we did not. Cute. Well, sorry. C calls that automatically. So we need to wrap this in something that gives us that other iterator when we call dot begin. 
And that's what the small instance of me is going to tell you exactly how to get. Yes, that is me. That is a small version of Jesper that knows it all. I create this class called srange. It's a wrapper around a container, as you can see here. And it implements just these two methods that the structural bindings will be calling to get the iterator, namely begin and end. And they do not provide the regular begin and end iterators, but instead these const key value begin and const key value end. And if we scroll down, there's also a mutable version here that calls the key value begin instead of the const key value begin. And now you can see here, I have my Q map. I want to iterate using the structural bindings. And for that, I simply call S range around my map. I can also modify it so S mutual range around my map. And now I can modify the values in here. The ampersand ampersand is because that the S mutual range is returning a proxy that is going to be a temporary. So we need, let's not go with that. The S range again here to print it out. And as you can see, it also works with hashes. So if you are in a hurry, it's okay. You can leave now. Thank you for watching yet another episode of Cute Widgets and More. But if you're not in a hurry. Okay. Time out. So everything you just said is good. It's actually true. Let me, let me not just badmouth my boss. Uh, but let me uh, compliment what you just said regarding this discussion about uh, range adapters. I shouldn't probably be calling them range adapters because now in C++, a range adapter is a specific thing. Uh, but fundamentally, that's what it's doing, right? Uh, we're developing a little helper class that uh, wraps uh, a given double quote range. In this case, it wraps a QMAP or a QHash or some container of that nature. And when you, uh, you call begin on the wrapper, this simply calls a different kind of begin onto the wrapped container. So it's going to call that uh, uh, const key value, I begin const key value uh, end uh, functions. Those return special kind of iterators. And when you iterate using them uh, and you reference the iterator, you end up getting back uh, pairs or proxy objects that allow you to access, uh, to see the, each element of a map or each element of a hash as a key value pair. Now, everything you just said is true, and that class is probably 10 lines of code you can steal and insert inside your own source code right here, right now. But, you know, there are much better news than that, or there is uh, a better way of doing the same. Uh, the better way is simply upgrade Qt. If you upgrade Qt to Qt 6.4, I believe, you will have uh, this function appearing on the screen right now. Let me actually see if I can find it. I don't find it. Sorry. You will see this function that you can see on the screen right now. And uh, this function, this set of functions, actually, it's a lot of overloads and uh, do exactly what uh, Jesper is talking about, except that you don't have to invent them uh, yourself. So in Qt 6.4, I added, uh, I personally added these functions um, that allow us to finally use uh, the um, range based forward loop in combination with structured bindings so to access both the key and the value of a given associative container. So it's all convenience, it's all good, and it's solved for you. Uh, there is still the minor annoyance that uh, you need to remember that uh, uh, you have to call these functions and iterate over whatever these functions return rather than iterate directly onto the map or the hash because those won't give you access to the key if you just do a straightforward iteration. Yep. Stay tuned for two small nitpicks on this code base here. First of all, I want to show you why I took a container reference in the S range rather than a const container reference in the case where it was not mutable. That's very subtle, but very deep stuff that you really want to understand if you ever use this code. The second thing is I would like to show you how I can create bindings for my own classes, structural bindings, so that I can write those. And I have examples for both of those. Let's start with the const in the S range. The const I'm referring to is here. Why didn't we take a const container reference and 
yeah, yeah, I need to make this one down const here too. That's a, that's cool. But why didn't I do that? That's what you usually do when you have something and it, it's the container is going to be, be accessed via const key value. So let's see. It does compile. Why? I must have been drunk. Nothing to see. Carry on. Well, we do carry on it one day. I'll be doing like this. I'm just creating a, uh, a method container. Uh, let's call it container, shall we? Get container that returns me an instance here. What do what is the value that I get there? Well, it's a temporary, right? Uh, so if I go down here and I now instead of this one here, I call get container. That should be fine. I wrap my container and we run it and it compiles. But see the output here. Lots of weird stuff. If any of my viewers out there is from a country that understand this, I would like to know what that symbol means. It likely means, yes, Burr, you are a bloody idiot because you, of course, should know that there is an issue with lifetime here. Get container returns me a temporary. The temporary will go out of scope as soon as we hit this closing brace here. So it goes out of scope, it gets garbage collected as range, on the other hand, is remembering a reference to that one. So that's a temporary that I remember a reference to and temporary gone out of scope. That is why I see all of these things. And that is why I said, let's not have const here. If I do not have const here and I try and compile it, it will tell me, sorry, you cannot bind an R value to uh, this because I cannot find any methods or any instantiation of your S range class here where I can give it an R value. This one is an L value. Okay, so that's a very interesting uh, complication, a very interesting twist of what looks like a relatively simple implementation. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, you don't want or you may not want to declare this S range uh, facility to uh, also accidentally accept things which are R values. And uh, the problem that indeed we try to prevent here is exactly what Jesper is talking about. It is very, very simple for you to uh, simply apply as range to an R value, like Jesper is doing here, just for demonstration purposes. And the entire thing will then, will then dangle because there is a lifetime issue at the end. Now, lifetime issues in C++ are uh, horrible to deal with. Uh, they constrain a lot of our design and, you know, they always require us to remember uh, when something may go out of scope too early, when something may get destroyed too early, and so we can no longer access it, and so on and so forth. Uh, generally speaking, we do have a few ways to cope with this, but uh, you know we're still far away from a complete, safe C++ world where these things are a thing of the past. However, there's some good news on the, on the horizon here. That is, uh, the code that Jesper has just demonstrated to you, the fact that you get, uh, uh, you would store a uh, const L value reference inside the S range and then apply it uh, inside the for loop and it would dangle. Well, that particular lifetime issue is actually fixed in C23. Uh, it's very subtle uh, and it has a lot to do with the how, again, the range based for loop. Uh, destructors itself into. So by definition, a range-based for loop is equivalent to a bunch of double quote traditional C++ code in which we evaluate the right part of the loop. So we get our container, then we call begin and end on it. So we get the iterators and then we loop using those iterators. Well, there are some subtleties in there that uh, uh, determine the lifetime of the container that we get. Uh, up until and including C++20, uh, that container could have gotten destroyed too early, like the code was showcasing here. But in C++23, that container will actually be alive throughout the entirety of the range-based for loop iteration. So that means that uh, uh, the code that Jesper said is wrong, it's got lifetime issue. Well, that lifetime issue, lifetime issue is not going to be there any longer when you use these together with a range-based for loop. However, on the other hand, that's just one case in which you may, in which you may dangle uh, the container. So assume that you're not passing the result of S range 
right immediately into a for loop. Suppose that you store it as a local object somewhere and then only later you iterate it upon. Well, in that case, C++ still does not save you. In that, in that case, C++ still would leave you with a dangling reference. And so I understand that uh, there is a good reason for fixing the range-based for loop, uh, but beware, it's not by any means a comprehensive fix. Uh, we still have, as I said, a long, long, long uh, way towards uh, lifetime safety in C++. Yes, I should very likely have added a comment above saying this must be an L value, otherwise you have the problem with temporaries and whatnot. That's another solution to this, namely to implement the R value version of my constructor. And let's see what that looks like. The R value version means that I'll make this const again. And uh, let's just, maybe I should have copied before I made a const. Huh? Of course, I'll need to remove the const again. And uh, what I'll be doing here is ampersand, ampersand. It still needs to instantiate this. And down here, you fatal, you can only give L values because how would I have a reference to the R value? Potato, potato, but there's another solution for you. Well, okay, now I really need to hit the peek into this. So uh, first and foremost, uh, don't do it like this. That is, does make much sense to have a function uh, that you know you can't call and it will crash at runtime uh, due to the Q fatal that the SPS just put in there. Uh, it would be a much simpler way to actually uh, delete that function. Okay, so in C++, we can delete arbitrary functions by just writing equal delete at the end of the signature. And that means that if that function is selected somehow by overload resolution, then you got an error. Compilation stops, uh, so it's a build error. And the compiler will tell you, you cannot call this function because it's got been deleted. So it means that the author of that function doesn't want you to use that function. That is, for instance, how things like uh, standard sconst or the equivalent qsconst work. They are precisely overloaded on uh, L value references and R value references, and the uh, R value overload is indeed deleted. So it, you will, if you open the documentation, you would see that it's there, but it's equal delete. It's not a runtime crash, right? What's the point of that? So a better implementation of what Jesper is trying to do here is indeed to declare the uh, R value overload. Uh, even better to make it even const, but that would be really, really something like nerd typing and delete the implementation. Now, you may, you may be wondering, OK, so uh, how about the thing that I just talked about, that is that all of this machinery is inside uh, QMAP and QASH directly? Uh, does it mean that you cannot call S key, uh, as a key value range on a R value map or a R value hash because they will dangle? And actually, the answer is no. You can call it and it would be safe to do. Uh, the implementation that I deployed pretty much uses a couple of tricks uh, that ensures that uh, uh, the container is safe to use in uh, all cases. So you can call as key value range on any sort of map. Doesn't matter that perhaps it, you got it as a temporary or it turned out of a function. And then you, um, you apply them this double quote range adapter on top of it, this wrapper, and you get the wrapper back that's fine. The wrapper will keep the map alive uh, for as long as needed if it was a temporary. So that's also another advantage of not using a hand-rolled solution because the actual trickery that you need to do to fix this lifetime problem are not entirely trivial. So you don't want to develop them yourself, do you? Right. Uh, in case you're curious, the same kind of semantics and the same kind of trickery will all also come to you in C20 and 23 uh, with the ranges library inside the standard library. Uh, if you have a temporary container, a temporary movable container like a QMAP or a QHash, and you uh, pipe it into some sort of adapter that will give you iterators that give you pairs of key value, that's how you would write this code in C23, uh, well, then the machinery inside the ranges will make sure that your map will be kept alive as long as needed. You want to really see that it works? 
well, I can compile it and I can even run it and it gives me an error because I forgot the semicolon here. Ah, why is there all these semicolon requirements in C++? And now, of course, I need to make this one const down here again. Why did you want me to show it that it worked? Huh, your fault. And there it is. And you dot, dot, dot. That's the Q fatal that hit there. But I actually like the other one because that gave me the error already at compile time. And finally, I would like to show you how you can implement your own unpacking mechanism for structural binding, namely for classes where you do not just have a tuple or a, a pair or the cute version or a regular struct just with public instance variables. And why do you need that? Well, honestly, I don't think you ever need that. But there are, when I did this, just to practice with it, there was quite a few flashbacks to the episodes on implementing some template code that I found very useful. And that's why it's in this episode, nevertheless. If you're leaving already now, see you next time. But otherwise, stay tuned. We are back to the split path here. The split path this time returns a mystruct. And the mystruct is this class here that has the base and the extension, just as before. But it also has a method for calculating the full length of that, uh, that file name. And that part isn't a instance variable. And besides, the, the string for the base and the extension isn't instance variables either. So the regular unpacking of structs doesn't work here. Okay, what Jasper, I think, meant here is that uh, uh, this particular struct, the base and extension are actually private. And if you look up the set of rules that say uh, what kind of data uh, can you destructure in C++, well, you can destructure different things. You can destruct uh, things like arrays. You can destruct things like structs with all public members uh, or other things. Uh, and indeed, this data type, as it is right now, uh, it would not qualify according to those rules. So you would not be able to destructure my struct using a structured binding declaration. We need to answer three things. First, we need to answer how many items are there in the struct that I'm unpacking. So square bracket, part one, comma, part two, comma, part three. That means three. So we'll answer three for that. The second thing we need to answer is the type of each of those, because behind the scenes, we need to set up the types for those. We actually create some magic in the structural binding. That's why it always says auto there, because the struct that is created behind the scene by the C++ compiler, you don't know the type of that, but it still needs the type of each of the elements. So that's why we need the second thing, namely the types. And the third thing, is the actual unpacking of the variable. So let's get started. The way that it works is that I will implement, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll do a template specialization on this tuple size. And if I just press F2 here, you can see template, type name, TP, and I'm in utility, so that's something that comes with C++. Template, type name, TP, struct, tuple size, tuple size. There is no implementation of that. That's what I'm, what I'm specializing here. So structs, stood tuple size, my structs, and I must return a, or I'm not return, uh, the, the, the struct that I'm, I'm specializing must have a value that is a static int, and that's the, the number of items in there. That's number one. Number two is the type of each of those. And for that, I have this stood tuple element now. And again, it's the same thing. It's a it's a specialization with the where I have both the type or the the the, the index of the element I'm talking about, so the zero for the zeros to part of the, for the first part of the the tuple, one for the second, and so on, and the type of the struct that I'm supporting on packing. And it looks like this. So my struct, that's the, the type that I support on packing. Number two. That is, if I scroll up here, zero, one, two. So that's the length that I have here. Number two is specifying this using type equal to int. And that's this type alias mechanism that I can now, somehow I can get my act on this. If I have a my struct, I can simply go uh, stood colon, colon, tuple size, less than two, comma, my struct, colon, colon, type. And that's an alias for 
an integer. I could do this for 0 and 1, 2, but I can also do the partial template a specialization here of saying stood size t index, and then they are both of them q strings. And with this in action, I just need the third and final part, namely to get the value out of the tuple. I've specified how many elements are there, what are their types, and now I need to get them out. And for that, I need to implement a global method called get. It must take my structs as an instance variable here, or as a, a variable here, and it's a template specialization on the index. And just like up here where I specialized for number two, I could have done that, but I can also do this trick here and take them all three in one go. So if const expression index equals to zero, so that's uh, the zeros element I'm asking for, then I'll just go to that struct that I got up there and return the base. And for one, I'll return the extension, and for two, I will return the length, which is, again, not an, an instance variable in that struct, but something I calculate on the fly. So implementing these three sets of methods or structs, I now support my own class. And it's boilerplate code, more or less, you can just take out of here. As I said, you're likely not going to need it all that much, mostly because that if you just have a regular struct, then it by magic works for all of your public instance variables in there. And again, you are more likely to just have std pair or std tuple or q pair or q tuple. Okay, so uh, yes, everything is said. That's uh, all fine. And uh, yes, that's a lot of boilerplate to make uh, a class destructible. So uh, there is something that it's called uh, in literature the tuple protocol, in the sense that uh, it's a protocol of designing a series of customizing, not designing, the design is already there, of customizing uh, a series of customization points, tuple size, tuple element, and get. And once you do that, and you do that in a consistent way, then your type becomes double quote, uh, tuple like and so it can be, uh, for instance, destructed. So all, all is good. Uh, there are a couple of twists in that. That is, uh, what happens if, for instance, you want to give access, uh, read-write access to a member of yours. For instance, you want to expose a data member, uh, which is normally private inside your class, but you want to return a mutable reference to it or a uh, const reference to it. If I go back just a few seconds here and we look at that, uh, at, that uh, um, uh, at the functions here on the screen, so you can see that this particular set of functions uh, is never returning references to anything, okay? So because it's either uh, an, uh, the, the each element is either uh, an integer or a string, but especially when you look at uh, the get function, the get is returning by auto. And if there's something that auto does when you return a reference, it's getting rid of that reference and always return you a value. So there are strategies uh, if you want to destructure a class that has private members, but somehow you want to um, still give uh, access to those members as references because you don't want to make extra copies. Uh, whether they are const references or mutable references, that's also another aspect of that. Uh, in general, if you want to know more about how to um, double quote streamline this boilerplate, it's not entirely avoidable, but there are some design patterns that you can just take and uh, use, and they work also in a more general case. Uh, then I'm going to leave you uh, with a little link, as usual, to a talk of a colleague of mine, Mark Mutz, uh, that, uh, uh, who explained this uh, way in depth in a video. I don't have time right now, I don't want to add another 20, 30 minutes of explanation about how to implement the tuple protocol. Uh, but indeed, go watch it uh, if you're interested into how to how does this apply to more complicated cases. Thank you for watching this episode on Qt Widis and more. And until next time, have a great time. And OK, so we reached the end of this. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, with this video, you get a little bit of appreciation of uh, how much effort goes into uh, producing one of these videos. Uh, yes, C++ is a complicated beast, and yes, there are so many subtleties, and it's not that I like to nitpick on Jesper. 
I also do countless and countless mistakes, and it's all thanks to the uh, goodwill of my co-workers that these mistakes don't see the light uh, and uh, they are immediately squashed in code reviews or similar reviews. But I think it's important to understand that uh, uh, even for producing 20 minute video, yes, there is a lot of research behind it. There is a lot of commentary, a lot of feedback that people uh, can give. So uh, rather than just, you know, smashing your head, your hands on your keyboard and uh, leaving harsh comments on Jesper's video, uh, I prefer to, you know, build something on top of it. Say, yeah, this is good. Let me just, you know, compliment what you just said uh, and let me also make a video. And uh, hopefully you will like this approach. Hopefully, hopefully you like this idea. And now I don't like to do sensationalistic clickbait videos like, oh my God, a developer reacts to some other person's C++. Uh, let's not do that, shall we? Okay. But if you like this content, uh, don't forget to subscribe to our videos. They are, we release them for free on YouTube so that we can increase uh, the knowledge of C++ in the broader community, the knowledge of Qt, the knowledge of a lot of technologies. So stay tuned for more videos like this. Thank you very much and have a good day.